only 130 years ago, the wheel was banned in Japan. The ruling shogun felt it would give his restless and potentially rebellious people mobility. He was wrong. He was very wrong. This is Japan's capital city today, Tokyo. A symphony in concrete and neon. Blade Runner meets Bedlam. The 18 million people who live here have wheels. They have lots and lots of wheels. But do they have mobility? Well, as it takes five hours to pop down the road for a pint of milk and five days to get to work in a morning, you'd have to say that no. They do not. There are five million cars in Tokyo, and every day, two million of them, that's more than are sold in Britain every year, come into and go out of the city centre. Japan is in love with the car, and as a result, it spends a fortune on it. In England, if you go to a motorist accessories shop, you'll be served by a man in a brown store coat whose most exciting product will be a beaded seat cover. Things are somewhat different in Japan. Even the smallest car accessory shop in Tokyo is very roughly the size of Northamptonshire. And the range of products on offer is quite simply astonishing. Air fresheners. Here it's possible to make your car smell of just about anything. Apple. Dew picked mushrooms. Chlorine. Linford Christie's feet. Not only is it important to have the right accessory, but that accessory must have the right collection of English words on it. The order is immaterial, such as full of sport, mind and luxury feeling super potential in winter wheel either or just a roller skate grand touring all over the physical ironic power crucial stuff plow through the 600 different types of fog lamp oh no reject the gold plated windscreen wipers on the basis that the gold is very probably plastic Notice that there are no beaded seat covers, even physically ironic ones, and you arrive in the burglar alarm section. Translated, that means stop touching, don't be naughty. Caught short in the awful traffic out there, an inflatable lavatory. You would probably call this a collection of vulgar steering wheels, but in Japan, they're street weapons. And then there are the gold keys. Well, gold plated and easy on the gold. In fact, now I come to think of it, hold the gold altogether. The car accessory business in Japan is worth 10 billion pounds a year. But that's hardly surprising when you remember that land prices in Tokyo are currently running at a staggering £200,000 for 3.3 square metres. No one has a big house. The only chance you get to show off is out on the road. If we had traffic jams like this in England, I swear I'd join Greenpeace. But that's because, in England, the most exciting thing in a car is the stereo. This is Japan, though, and in Japan, industry has not forgotten its commuters. This is an in-car entertainment console. Let's, uh, let's watch some TV. Oh, no. The only sport more boring than cricket. Get rid of that. Get it off! Get it off! Let's play some cards! Twist. 
Okay, you've beaten it, so that's cost me $30, so I'm going to teach myself English. Right, useful phrases around the world, okay? Let's see what it says about give me a break. Give me to a give me no kogo teki na ikata. Give me a break. What about a, what about a contact, though? Give me a break. Parking, too, is something else. We have Alton Towers, Paris has Euro Disney, Japan has its multi-story car parks. Turntables get you pointing in the right direction, then you drive into what can only be described as a big vending machine, remembering to get out of your car before it's whisked away. The chap in the Porsche had been there for a week. They've got on-street parking pretty sussed out, too. The meters have infrared sensors, so if you come back and feed them every hour, they know you haven't moved your car. If you park illegally, you get clamped, which in Tokyo means you get one of these on your door mirror. And the shame of driving around with a yellow tag fluttering in the slipstream means most drivers will pay the fine and have it removed before driving off. Something tells me it's a system that wouldn't work terribly well in Britain. Though that's not to say that cars don't get towed in Tokyo, they do, by teams who redefine the concept of efficiency. Thirty seconds, and it's gone. Mind you, if you drive a car like that, you deserve to have it towed away. But, you're saying, what's so different about the system in Tokyo? I mean, let's face it, they tow cars away all over the world. Well, I'll tell you what's different about the system here. This is. So, the guy comes back, there's his number plate, that says Shinjuku Police Department, and that is where it's been towed to. Now, he's got to go off and spend the best part of half a day getting it back. It's going to cost him £180. But it was a works van, all right? Now, that means the owner of the company that sent him here is looking at a £1,000 fine. If the chalk gets washed away, one has to presume he's also looking at the world's hardest ever game of hide-and-seek. Now, Japan is an orderly society. They have far more patience than, say, the Italians. But Tokyo is a pressure cooker. You couldn't possibly live here and not let off steam once in a while. drove like that on the public roads, you deserve to be called a maniac. Drifting has now become so popular that the sport has legitimised itself with organised events at racetracks. Speed is unimportant, but style is everything, and you're judged in much the same way as Torville and Dean by the man who started it all, the Drift Okingu. When I was racing, everybody knew that I would win. So to stop people being bored and fed up with the same old thing, I started drifting the car through the corners, much more than the other drivers, to keep people interested, but it improved the popularity of the sport. He still does spectacular demonstration runs today, though he handicaps himself by wearing a pair of marigolds and driving a standard road car. And standard road cars, as you can see, are no good. Many years ago, the racers were only interested in hard springs. In the last two to three years, the drivers have become more interested in the suspension setups for these events, which are very, very popular in Japan these days. If you look at the top racers, they now have racing car standard suspension. So how mad do you have to be to do this? What sort of people are we talking about here? Mostly young guys who love cars and driving. They want to be racing drivers, but they don't have the money. So, have you decided on a winner today? 
Hi. Well, while he went off to polish the laurels, the guys went out for some sideways shenanigans. This time they were all forced to wear marigolds, but like good racing drivers, they blamed their cars. They should have been using one of these. Though at £50,000, the Nissan Skyline GTR is too expensive for the drifters. It's within easy reach, though, of the boys in the Midnight Club. To join, your car must be capable of at least 160 miles an hour, and what the members do is meet up at a service station late at night and race down the Tokyo to Yokohama Expressway. The Porsche 911, some of which can and do do 200 miles an hour, has been the boss for years. But today, most people use the Skyline. So what is this car then? Well, the 2.6-litre, six-cylinder engine has two ceramic turbochargers, which can be tuned to give as much power as your internal organs can handle. I hear 850 horsepower is as high as you can go. But the strange thing is, the chassis could take more. The chassis could take a lot more. Thanks to the fitment of several computers, each of which makes a Cray look like a golf ball typewriter, the Skyline's four-wheel drive system takes the laws of physics and wipes its shoes on them. Its staggering ability to get round corners has made it Japan's best ever race car. And even on the road, you'd have to say, it's nothing short of physically ironic. The Skyline GTR makes the Porsche 959 look like it came out of the design studios of Freddie Flintstone. And on a racetrack, the Skyline would be faster than a Ferrari 355. In a battle between Japanese techno wizardry and Italian design flair, Japan would win. The Skyline, and I'm not joking, is one of the best cars I have ever driven. But at the same time, it's one of the very nastiest cars I've ever sat in. The seats are crafted from pure Volgalore. The dash is hewn from a solid block of pure plastic. I need to get out. The trouble is, things don't get any better. You would have thought if you were designing a car to take on the Porsche 928 and the Ferrari 355, you'd make it look just a little bit more exciting than this. But maybe they can't. Maybe they don't know how to. Maybe they have the same problem with their cars as they do with their buildings. All these blocks are designed to take 7.5 on the Richter scale. But are they pretty? And one of Japan's top conceptualizers agrees. On the engineering front, the skyline is the dog's part. But as a piece of design, it's a dog's dinner. I think the specifications of the car are very good. The technology is excellent in the car, and the handling is very good. Excellent, in fact. But the design is very bad. I think there's a major problem with the design and styling of the car. It should be an interface of people's hearts and emotions in what they build. But that is not happening with Japanese cars. The manufacturers put their priority on effectiveness. That's why they have forgotten their humanness in car design. The Mitsubishi Debonair is a case in point. Its dull and tedious body is in no way compensated for by its satellite navigation screen, which, when you engage reverse, becomes a TV that shows what's behind. Parking then becomes easy, but why would you have wanted to get into the car in the first place? And then there's the Mitsubishi Super Exceed. This is the ugliest car I've ever seen, and I just don't care about its electric roof ports. I do care, though, why your man drives a Metro. In Japan, the Honda Civic 1300 is in the same class as the Rover Metro. Here it's called the Rover 114. Although it is small, the Rover is unique in its originality, its creativity, it is very imaginative and very comfortable. It is like furniture with an engine. The Mazda MX-5, seen here in prototype hardtop form, shows that Japan can make a pretty little car, if it copies what Europe was doing 30 years ago. Part of the problem may well be that Western car companies, as a general rule, were started by one man who wanted to make cars. Henry Ford, Colin Chapman, Enzo Ferrari. 
Now, Japanese car companies, with the exception of Honda, were started by corporations who wanted to make money. Now, to get round that problem, Mazda has opened this astonishing facility called the M2 building. And here, stylists can work away from the big business environment. Here, they can let their imagination... pull in and an army the size of which hasn't been seen since it all went quiet on the Western Front descends ironically and physically on your winter wheels, Ivor. And yet if you want a simple oil change, they call on the services of R2-D2. Not surprisingly, some people hanker after the old days. Trouble is, trying to find a Japanese-made car from the 1920s is like trying to find a needle in a haystack that has no needle in it. I don't drive the Bentley every day, but people in Japan rarely see old cars, and they wave, especially when they see a monk driving a Bentley. This temple has 470 years of history and 26 generations of monk. And I feel the history and tradition of the place. It's probably this reason why I have an interest in old English cars. Also, my father drove a Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost for three months. So that must have helped too. Japan is one of the world's most prolific car-producing nations. So what does he think of the homespun product? Europe has a long history of over 100 years of car making, but Japan only started in the 1930s. There's a great difference between Japanese and European cars. I don't mean that I don't like Japanese cars, but it's more fun to drive a European car.
If I can compare cars, for instance, German cars drive very fast and perform well, but I much prefer the Bentley's mood. I feel that the car is alive, a living creature, almost human. That's why the car breaks down every now and again. I'm not interested in German cars because they don't break down. Well, that may be just a joke, but given the choice of any car in the world, what would he drive? Surprise, surprise, a Bentley Continental. <laughs> Having a European car, though, isn't enough. It has to be left-hand drive, even if it's British. That makes it more foreign, more exotic. However, there's one type of European car where you can't tell which side the steering wheel's on. If, while driving around Tokyo, you happen upon an S-Class Mercedes-Benz with blacked-out windows, here's a tip. Get out of its way. At night, the senior side of Tokyo, prostitution, protection rackets, that sort of thing, is run by an operation called the Yakuza. Now, these guys are tough. These guys cut their own little fingers off every time they make a mistake, one knuckle at a time. They're like the Mafia. And then some. Until recently, they drove Jaguars, but today, just about all of them have S-Class Mercs. And so, resisting the temptation to ask if they'd seen black rain or if they were packing heat, I stayed uncontroversial and asked, with a bit of a quaver in my voice, given the choice of any car in the world, what did it be? The first choice would be a Mercedes-Benz, and second, a Rolls-Royce. Why do you like Mercedes-Benzes? It is built well, and it is very strong. And why do you have left-hand drive? It just so happens that the car is left-hand drive. I didn't especially look for left-hand drive. Fibber! No Yakuza would be seen dead in a right-hand drive car. Having a foreign car is a way of expressing yourself to other organizations and other companies. Successful businessmen, company directors and people like the Yakuza will have big foreign cars because they have more space. They have more status and they are more expensive. So if I were to offer him a lift home tonight in my Nissan Micro with a bit of rust on the tailgate and some empty fag packets in the footwell, what would he say? Well, he'd say, thank you very much. So, there is organized crime, but car theft is virtually unheard of. Now, men in suits will give you all sorts of complicated reasons for that. 2% unemployment, different family values, but... The real reason is this. If, when you go to bed at night, someone comes along and steals your car, when you get up in the morning and find it's gone, it'll only be 40 feet away, stuck in a traffic jam. In Tokyo, the car is finished as a viable means of transport. So now it's starting out in a new and risky life as a fashion accessory. And as a rather expensive karaoke machine. Are you Give me a break.